So welcome everyone to our third and final uh, 1.30 discussion. Throughout Founding Week, we've been celebrating uh, the works of our alumni, students, and now our faculty, just a glimpse into the world of our faculty. So what we'll do, I, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Vic Liptek, who will be taking us over from here. So Scott, if you're welcome to keep your uh, mic on, but if you wanna just turn your camera off and we'll turn it over to Vic. Thank you. Um, I'm so used to seeing my uh, virtual background that I'm a little shocked to find myself back in my actual kitchen. So I hope you don't mind <laughs> that I'm speaking from um, and working from my kitchen, but thank you all for being here. We really appreciate um, that you're joining us for Founding Week and for this discussion series. And in particular, I'm grateful that you're here, you're here to listen to our faculty talk about some of their great projects. Um, we have three projects that we're gonna try to get to today. Um, we have a presentation from Eleni Glekas and Chala Hadami on um, our cultural heritage management grant from the State Department with the University of Baltistan, which is in Pakistan. Um, and I will introduce them shortly. We have Archives of the Self, um, which is a, a summer course. That It's a course that will be offered this summer. Um, and it's, it will be presented by Scott Harrison and Dorothy Clark. And Eleni Glickas is also involved with that, but she's, she's gonna stick to just the, the Baltistan presentation. And then finally, we have a presentation on uh, world history through the lens of critical race theory and human geography that will be presented by Dorothy Clark. So I would like to introduce um, Eleni Glickas and Chala Hadami, who may want to join me image-wise so that I can see you and, and welcome you to, to the screen, to the stage, to, to whatever we call this. Um, thank you very much for being here. Um, briefly, um, Eleni is the Director of Historic Preservation, our Master of Design Studies program here at the BAC. Many of you know her, she's taught with us for a long time. She's also the principal for the grant with the University of Baltistan. And she's been working on our State Department grants with Pakistan for many, many years and has done an extraordinary job. And we're so grateful to you for doing that, Eleni. And with the, with working with Eleni on the grant is Chala Hadami, who's been with us since 2002. I just found that out. Wow, that's a long time. Thank you so much, Chala, for sticking around this long. Um, and uh, I understand that you, I know that you teach in architecture, but as well in foundation, mostly do studio stuff. And um, we'll be working with Eleni. She is the assistant um, prince or the co-principal, really the assistant project manager for uh, the University of Baltistan project. And I'm just going to let you jump in and take it away. Um, after, uh, when, when you're done presenting, we'll see, we'll get some questions and answers going before we move on to our next project. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for that introduction, Vic. And um, Eliza, if you can go ahead and put our um, presentation up. Um, Chal and I will shut our cameras off briefly so you can uh, see the presentation. Um, go ahead and get started. So. Um, as Vic uh, introduced, my name is Eleni Glegas, Director of Historic Preservation and Project Director for our partnerships um, with National College of Arts and the University of Baltistan. And Chala Hadami, our faculty of the School of Architecture is also joining us today. Um, next slide. So I'd like to start by giving some background on our partnerships. Um, we started working uh, with first with National College of Arts in fall of 2013 through um, a university partnership that was funded by the State Department and the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad. And this is part of a larger uh, university partnership program between U.S. and Pakistani and Afghani colleges and universities. Our um, partnership was the only one on the theme of cultural heritage and architecture. Other partnerships ranged from a variety of topics to business development, IT management, um, urbanism, um, graphic design, so on and so forth. So we started in 2013 with NCA and we have continued our partnership through a series of grants, um, 
also funded by the State Department. Um, and in this year, in the beginning of this year, the State Department approached us about starting a new university partnership with the University of Baltistan in Skardu. So a little background about both institutions, although we will be focusing mostly on Baltistan for today's talk. The National College of Arts has a lot of similarities to the BAC. It is the premier art and design uh, college in Pakistan. Their mission was originally to preserve the craft tradition of Punjab. Um, they have a mandate uh, by the government to accept students from every single region in Pakistan, including territories. Their main campus is in Lahore in Punjab. And um, so they were founded in 1875 as the Mayo School of Industrial Art. In 1958, became the National College of Arts and their programs range from you know various fine arts, architecture, cultural studies, film and television, industrial design and musicology. Um, and in 2006, they established a second campus in Rawalpindi, which is right outside of uh, Islamabad. Next slide. Oh yes, thank you. Uh, the University of Baltistan in Skardu is a new university that is in the Gilgit Baltistan region. It's in the northernmost portion of the country. It was founded in 2017 as an offshoot of Karakoram International University. Um, you know, their mission is to offer quality education and research opportunities that's focused mostly in the Gilgit Baltistan region. Uh, their new programs include tourism and hospitality management, cultural studies, sciences, business management, um, and we're working with them on forming a new department of heritage studies and archaeology. And I'll talk more about that later. So I'll hand it over to Chala. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We thought we'd introduce Gilgit Baltistan to you briefly through images, uh, Skadu more specifically, and some examples of the area's heritage. Uh, the city of Skardu is located in the northeast corner of Port Pakistan in the Karakoram mountain range, part of the complex of ranges, including the Himalayas, that ring South Asia. Next. Skardu is the largest city in the Pakistan-administered territory of Gilgit-Baltistan, with borders on China, Afghanistan, and the Indian-administered territories of Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh. This area was part of an independent Greater Kashmir region. You can see that area on the right image until the partition of India in 1947. At that time, the predominantly Muslim population of Gilgit, Baltistan, desired to merge with Pakistan. Uh, not until 1970 was Pakistan finally granted control of the area. And just this November, Pakistan's Prime Minister announced that Gilgit Baltistan would be upgraded to provisional province status, thus becoming Pakistan's fifth province. Next. The territory was originally administered separately as Gilgit and Baltistan. It is a sparsely populated area with a density of about 44 people per square mile. Compare this with Punjab province with a density of over 1,400 people per square mile. More than 30 native languages are spoken, as well as Urdu, the pa uh, Pakistan's administrative language. Uh, the university actually teaches in English. Baltistan, known also as Little Tibet, is home to the Balta people of Tibetan descent. Next. The topography is clearly a major feature and led to isolation over the centuries. Until 1984, with the construction of the Karakoram Highway, access from Pakistan was only by plane via what has been described as one of the most dangerous flying routes in the world. Despite the topography, evidence suggests that the Silk Route ran through this region. Next. Zooming into Skardu itself, you see its location in a valley, the Skardu Valley, delineated by the Indus River to the north and mountains on other sides. These rise steeply, and in the plain you see agriculture and alpine deserts created by expansive deposits of sediment from mountain er erosion. The large rock in the north was the location of an 8th century fort. Next. Agricultural plots are scattered within the city along with housing. The architecture is low-lying, nestled within the vegetation. Mosque minarets and domes pop up above the trees. Next. 
On the right, you can see the thresholds between arable land, desert, and river. Next. The average maximum temperature in summer is 77 degrees, and the mountains protect Skadu from the monsoons. Next. In winter, the average minimum temperature is 23 degrees. Surprising to me, the average maximum snow ac accumulation is only about 5.5 inches in Skadu City. Next. So if you Google Skadu, you'll find amazing shots like this of stunning mountainous terrains. Next slide. There are three major lakes in the Skadu Valley. One, Satapara, has been dammed for hydroelectricity hydro and water for household and agricultural use. So landscape is included in the heritage that the university seeks to document, study, and preserve. Rock carvings in Gilgit Baltistan evidence human presence dating back to 2000 BC. Besides the Tibetan and Muslim identity mentioned earlier, the area has a history of Hindu, Buddhist, and Sikh control and the influence of Persian culture. Next. This rock carving located outside the city of Gilgit possibly dates back to the seventh century. Uh, note the typo on the slide, by the way. Next, thank you. Uh, Islam came to the area in the 14th century via Persian and Central Asian Sufi preachers and scholars. Amberic Mosque, one of the oldest in Baltistan, was built by traveling Persian craftsmen and actually won a UNESCO award in 2005. Next slide. Just this, just this June, a four-ton cross was discovered in the region, in Skadu. It is believed to be Christian, possibly dating to the 14th century. The first such cross found in the area, its discovery will reveal much about the people who have lived in or passed through the area. Next slide. Next, yeah, thank you. The point here is that the multiplicity of artifacts in the region reference a plurality of religious identities along with a variety of different languages. Moreover, as is seen in this one carved rock, the various peoples practiced a coexistence and a respect for pluralism, and that continues to today. Next. Thank you, Eleni, back to you. Um, next slide, please. So our current goals for our partnership with University of Baltistan um, is, there are four main goals. The first is uh, curriculum development. We are working with them to create a new Bachelor of Science program uh, in heritage management and archaeology. Um, our colleagues over there are already fairly well versed in archaeology, and so we're providing the heritage management and historic preservation components to the uh, curriculum. And we would also um, be having uh, UOBS faculty and students uh, participating in BAC online historic preservation courses. This is something that we did with uh, National College of Arts as well, and it was a resounding success. Um, we will also be doing training workshops with our colleagues at UOBS in heritage documentation, heritage management, and materials conservation techniques. And this will be led by BAC faculty and, and alums. And in the picture here, um, it you will see Rebecca Krieger, who is the faculty for materials conservation in the historic preservation program, um, doing a materials conservation workshop with NCA students um, in the walled city of Lahore in Pakistan. And this was in 2019. And along with Kyle Bernard, also pictured there, uh, picking something up off the floor. Um, he is an alumnus of the historic preservation program at the BAC as well. Another aspect of our partnership will be to assist um, University of Baltistan in creating a digital archive that will document and catalog the rich cultural heritage of the region, um, as shown by Chala in the previous slides. And so our role will be um, providing investigation, due diligence, and support in uh, helping uh, establish this. And finally, um, the cultural exchange aspect is one of the most important um, aspects of these types of partnerships that the State Department really likes to see. Um, so traveling, uh, it's very important for, you know, the 
us at the BAC to go to Pakistan regularly and for our Pakistani colleagues to come to the United States. Um, and it really increases the collaboration between students and faculty at both institutions. Next slide. So some of the benefits for BAC students and faculty um, is that they gain exposure to cultural heritage and architecture in Pakistan. Uh, it's not a country where many people get to travel to very easily. Um, having in the past, having NCA students and faculty in BAC online courses has been, again, very successful. Um, it is definitely a way for students to um, learn about different parts of the world. Um, and, you know, when students and faculty from uh, NCA and now University of Baltistan come to Boston uh, for for visits, you know, it's an opportunity to meet students and faculty. We go to conferences together. We do, uh, normally we do a yearly trip to New Mexico, although with the pandemic, that's not happening now. Um, and probably the most important benefit is that it openly contradicts myths of how Pakistani culture is perceived um, and vice versa. You know, the more Pakistanis that come to the United States, it really dispels myths about, you know, the um, American culture and really uh, is kind of proof that educational partnerships like this can promote positive diplomatic relations between um, our two countries. Right. Next slide. Uh, for future goals, you know, we just started this new partnership with the University of Baltistan, but we also have an ongoing partnership with NCA. We would like to expand our partnerships in the U United States and Pakistan with other institutions. We have started to do this with the Museum of Fine Arts pre-pandemic, um, and we hope to uh, continue this moving forward. We would like to transition to project-based work, um, you know, less course development and curriculum development and more, you know, urban revitalization studios or, you know, expanding on the digital archive with UOBS, and also incorporating new themes like urbanism, intangible heritage, indigenous heritage, and sustainability. Um, and branching out into other countries in South Asia as well. So on behalf of Chala and myself, uh, thank you so much, and we look forward to your questions. Oh, anybody else here? Yeah, okay. Um, let's see if there are any questions in the chat. Um, but I would first like to ask, if you don't mind, um, I'm very interested in, you know, in the the, um, the intersection with the BAC and our students and our faculty. So uh, cultural exchange, um, clearly there will be opportunities for online, online learning um, that, you know, cross the globe. Uh, when do you imagine that people will be able to travel from Baltistan to here um, and you know from here over to Baltistan. What are what what are your plans within the grant right now? Um, right now, I mean, if we didn't have this pandemic, we would probably have already hosted our first group from Baltistan. That was our original intent. Um, it's to do two trips a year. You know, one trip to Pakistan and another trip to Boston, um, mm -hmm. and potentially a third trip over the summer. But uh, we hope to resume travel as soon as everyone can get vaccinated. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think the summer might be a little ambitious, but, um, and we've also discussed this with the State Department, you know, when do they think that we would, they would allow us to travel and, you know, for them it's, it's as soon as humanly possible. So um, if the pandemic continues to disrupt our travel plans, you know, we might have to get a one year extension on our, our partnership, but you know, we hope to start resuming travel next year and um, hopefully in the future bringing uh, students and alums uh, when when possible uh, to Pakistan, but definitely on domestic trips within the United States. We would mm -hmm. love to have uh, the larger BAC community join us. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll make sure that happens. <laughs> um, uh, so Eliza, can you tell me, is, there, is, is the chat the way that people will be asking questions or is there another way? Um, Eliza hiding in the background, but I know that she's there. I, I'm here, and yes, uh, if anyone has questions, please, please use the chat feature uh, on your screen. You can, if you see, on uh, Rob said, "Amazing job, Professor Mahesh! Great overview." Uh, Kobe, stunning. Yeah, uh, great appreciation for the images. Thank you so much. It really helped us imagine. Um, 
the need for cultural exchange. Uh, and um, and another question uh, that didn't come through the chat, but it's coming up on my my email here um, for <laughs> Eleni is: Do you have any advice for other faculty members? You know, you you were uh, the PI on this grant, which is remarkable. Um, but what best advice do you have for other faculty who might like to to look to something like this? Um, I would say you know start uh, networking with other colleagues like outside of academia, you know, with different NGOs, definitely with the State Department, they are more accessible than one might think. Um, there are, specifically for cultural heritage, there are a lot of grants out there for um, more sort of like physical restoration work through the State Department's Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation. Um, so if you have colleagues in other countries, um, you know, that are interested in uh, cultural heritage preservation, that's, you know, the Ambassadors Fund projects are a great place to start. Um, so any grants coming out of any public affairs uh, office from any embassy will usually be, there's usually a cultural heritage component to them. So just start looking around on grants.gov. The National Endowment for Humanities is another one. Um, and, you know, that's, there are just, there are a lot of opportunities out there. It is difficult to, to find them all. But the more you keep talking to people, the more um, you're likely to run into them. Thank you for that. Uh, I have another question and then we're going to go to um, our next presentation, but this is from Kobe. Um, she says, I know you were anticipating this question from me. Had you considered whether we can take a class online at NCA or SCARDU someday? <laughs> uh, no, we hadn't considered that. I guess the pandemic has definitely changed things. I know at NCA they've been doing a lot of online instruction for their classes. Neither institution, neither institution has um, a, the capacity to offer online only courses at this point, spe specifically asynchronous courses. Uh, that's something we had considered with NCA in the past, but they weren't really interested or really ready to go down that route. Um, but you know, maybe in the future, now that the pandemic has definitely changed the way that we learn, um, we might there might be an opportunity to do that. Who knows? Great question. Two, two quick questions. Uh, Rob says, I know the BAC has these relationships with the universities in Pakistan. Does the relationship foster, rela foster relationships between the universities in Pakistan? Does our relationship to them foster, mm. I'm imagining the question is that the relationship between the universities in Pakistan. So like a connection between University of Baltistan and NCA? Yes. Not yes. yet. Um, that's something we had been talking about. Uh, earlier on, I think we want to get some more, uh, at least get the new curriculum for the new Bachelor of Science program settled at University of Baltistan first, and then maybe in a couple years, they'll be ready for some joint research opportunities. I think that would be great. But uh, we have not started actively pursuing that at this time. Okay, last question. It's from Heather. Um, with the curriculum development we're working on, are our faculty also training and coaching on delivery and teaching methods? Do you want me to take this one? Elena? Sure, yeah. yeah. Chala's already been working on that. So please go ahead, Chala. Um, yeah, actually the uh, university is in the process of hiring faculty. Uh, so until that happens, we won't be training anyone. We, they do have a faculty member who is ready to go with anthropology. They do, they're less experienced uh, around the issue of heritage, preservation, conservation, et cetera. Um, so we will be definitely uh, training. Um, that is part of the big conversation uh, and uh, methods as well as content. At the end, we will take additional questions. We'll certainly, if there are questions that come up in the chat, we'll make sure they get to you. Um, and we, we're gonna move to our next presentation. So thank you, Eleni, Chala, thank you. Um, and I'm hoping to see Scott and Dorothy pop onto the screen very soon um, to talk about um, archives of the self. Oh, yeah. Come on in, Dorothy, you were there. Come on back. Uh, um, Archives of the Self, the course that is proposed for the summer. Scott is our, well, 
He's the Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs. I work closely with him and I'm so lucky to do that. He's also the Director of Liberal Studies and teaches in Liberal Studies. Uh, Dorothy is teaches in Liberal Studies. She also is the, she does the edit, editing and publishing work for Historic New England, really important role. And I found out that Dorothy was on the Boston Globe <laughs> team that won a Pulitzer for covering Ooh. the Boston Marathon bombing. Like, yeah. I, wow, I'm, I didn't know that. And I'm yeah, very, very impressed. Anyhow, please take it away, folks. Oops, we can't hear Scott. Can anyone hear me? Okay. Turn in. Turn in. There we go. Thanks so much, my friend. Um, hi, everyone. It's so good to be here with you all today. And it's so wonderful to share the room with um, so many wonderful colleagues, Rob Anderson, I think Karen Nelson is here. Um, and thanks, Vic, for that, that very warm uh, introduction. So Dorothy and I are gonna do something a little different um, with our time. We're actually just going to, um, instead of presenting more formally, we are going to discuss and have a sort of interview with each other um, to uh, make clear how it is that we arrived at this notion of a summer course for our students titled Archives of the Self, um, a course which thinks about subjective self-expression but really the ways in which our voices are maintained and preserved for history or not preserved because archives are also full of silences, um, epistemological um, uh, and sort of silence uh, based in oppression um, and erasure. So Dorothy, the, Ooh, the whole boy. notion of this course really starts with you. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was, it, was, it was because of you that we came to the notion of this course. Mm -hmm. and it's because of your work with Historic New England. Yes. Um, can you tell so our audience Historic a little bit New about England that? We launched a project called uh, To Collect uh, for their archives, images, uh, diary entries, anything that the public wanted to share with us about their time during COVID, during uh, the lockdown, how they fared. And I know of a couple of other cultural heritage institutions that also did this. But we were also interested in bringing in some student help, possibly as interns, to help catalog all of this stuff. So we held a meeting, Historic New England and BAC, and we were just talking about the possibilities of doing this. And during our conversation, Scott said, archives of the self. And a big light bulb went off for me. I just thought that that was a really moving and cool term. And so then Scott, Eleni, and I decided after our meeting with Historic New England, let's go back and talk about maybe doing this as a course. So we just started tossing out ideas about what could this be. And Scott came up with a pretty great description of what this course would be. And it, it turned out we were all pretty much on the same uh, wavelength here. So you can see the description that's um, up there. You can study it there because I won't read it to you and take up the time that we have here that we're talking to one another. But we've also had conversations about, oh, what will this course do for those who participate in it? Mainly students, but I think it will also have an effect on the faculty. So, Scott, what were your thoughts about delving into this? Thanks, Dorothy. Um, Eliza, if you could maybe just please take that slide down just for one moment. Um, th thank you so much. So, yeah. You know, Dorothy, I was really energized by you and Eleni. Um, and what happened was you had, on the one hand, you had Historic New England saying, mm -hmm. we're gonna collect sort of ephemera that people are, are you know, um, that they have around them in their homes during this pandemic. And we also had this thing of Historic New England saying, maybe BAC students could be interns for us. And I think the jump that you mm -hmm. and Eleni and me made was we need to do more, um, in fact. And the first thing we sort of did was conceptually say that this moment, the, the COVID moment, but also let's remember what this summer was like with um, continual civil rights marches that are still happening today after the murder of George Floyd. We decided that the home as a conceptual unit, a conceptual analytical unit was too narrow. 
right? For particularly for BAC students, if they were going to be talking to historic New England about their lives and archiving um, their lives and themselves, right? Because we are a school that hosts um, so many international students. And so our students were, were actually, in effect, feeling, in some cases, forced out of their homes or in transit, right? So the sites that our students would be cataloging their voices or the voices of others might be in airports, sometimes in immigration checkpoints, um, sometimes in forced quarantine. So we decided that we wanted to sort of vivify or revivify the interplay between, you know, in and out, between where one is considering home for the moment and the sort of outside world. Um, secondly, um, we also thought that the home as an analytical unit implied too much stability, right? Because again, so many folks feel as if um, they were forced from their homes or in, often in transit during the pandemic, but also because um, so many of us were entering the public sphere during a moment of political unrest and political protest, right? So I think we were really interested in seeing how it is that our students lived um, and made sense of the summer of George Floyd. And so that's what we started to turn more towards the public sphere and archiving that moment. And if I remember correctly, Dorothy, you and I as professionally trained historians were saying that we want these archives, the archives that our students construct and investigate to do more than simply say, well, history mm -hmm. serves so we don't repeat the, the mistakes of the past. I don't, you and I both know yes. we repeat the past yes. in, in troubling ways every day. So I think the archives we're going to build with our students are focused on disrupting existing power structures and provoking future generations. If we haven't addressed systemic racism in 10 years, the archives are going to ask us that, right? And if we haven't prepared for the next pandemic um, in 10, 20, 30 years, the archives are going to ask us why. And, and so maybe we could turn to a few, if it's okay with you, to the learning outcomes of the course. So Eliza, if you could be so kind, um, to please okay. put back up the slides and we'll mm -hmm. guide you a little bit. You go over to the next. Yes. So, Dorothy, do you want to just okay. touch briefly upon so maybe the first two learning we'll outcomes? We'll have students looking through, uh, considering using a variety of mediums, how they would um, express both historical and contemporary actors. And what does this mean? What parts of yourself, what ideas of yourself, what items, what material culture you have, would you save? And another idea around this that I'm thinking of is it's about raising an awareness of both the self and outside. It's also, um, looking at yourself objectively or, or having others looking at you or looking at others looking at you. And also there's the subjective component to that because no, we should not be living our lives with others directing it or telling us you're acting this way, you're acting that way. But just wondering, collecting, observing how others observe us and then how we observe ourselves. So we also want to look at and recognize that there is cacophony in all of the stuff around us that is our material culture. And yet there is silence. And you will also find this in official archives where there's a whole lot of minutia that's collected among the ephemera mm -hmm. and a lot of it, it you know it's it's cool because it's old and it, it was saved you know like you've got receipts from somebody else i mean imagine what's going to happen to all those receipts you got from cvs <laughs> those those things but there are also uh, places in the archives that are silent, rich, or I should say they appear to be silent, which mm -hmm. if you listen hard enough, if you look hard enough, you can glean the story, glean what the story is from this. What isn't it saying loudly? <laughs> so. 
Right. I, that's a, a fantastic question to pose to students, mm -hmm. right? It provides a sort of counter yes. reading of an archive, right? The archive will give you something sort of up front, but that, what the archive gives you up front has its own sort of politics, right? Who is in that, whose voice is worth recovering mm -hmm. for history and whose voices go unheard. Uh, so I'm thinking of right now, you know, there are 25% of Americans who are over $5,000 behind on their rent uh, right now, right? As we move to the end of December, I'm going to imagine that it's going to be really hard for those, the, the voices of those folks to crack through, right? Into the mainstream sort of news press. Mm -hmm. So if we're using newspapers with students, what's the headline, but what is the subtext? You know, like who is really not there and why might that be? And, and Dorothy and Eleni and I also, again, want to do more than have our students sort of be passive interns at Historic New England. We want them to think and to use their design skills to create their own archives of the self, to catalog their own subjectivity in this moment, and to think about how they would display that to the world. How would people walk through your archive? What would they have to see? Uh, and, and how can we you know, combine design thinking and historical thinking, really rigorous analysis of primary sources to have a meaningful uh, discourse between those two fields? And um, I think part of our maybe overly ambitious hope right now is that these archives are displayed um, as, you know, at some point in fall 2021 or perhaps uh, later than that, Mm -hmm. as a moment of reemergence and sort of rebirth um, mm -hmm. for folks to, to visit something in public and to take stock, to really take stock of what this moment was. Um, Absolutely. Dorothy, does that make sense to you? Am I missing and, anything? And uh, we have come up with uh, some ideas about how would students go about doing this? Uh, how would they collect things about themselves? One idea, which I wish I could say it was original, but I, I snagged it from somewhere. Make a video of, of yourself. Yourself here now addressing who you will be in the future. And forgive yourself, apologize, chastise, whatever, but you want to talk to that person you mm. uh, think you're going to be in the future mm. and you want to explain what you are doing now. So that is one project that uh, they could work on. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, that that is actually quite fascinating, Dorothy. If we could, Eliza, could we please go to the next slide? Because we'd like to provoke our audience a little bit. Um, Dorothy's got this really, I think, fantastic assignment idea. But we were wondering from the audience, please ask us questions in the chat. But we were wondering you as audience members, what would future generations, what must they know about you and how you live during this moment? And we know there are so many brilliant um, teachers and instructors in this room. If you could come up with assignments for this course, what would they be? And we ask mm -hmm. because we're not there yet. We're still developing this course. It is very much, you know, um, coming into being. Um, so we would provoke you a bit to ask um, how you've experienced mm -hmm. this moment, what you'll remember yes. and what you want others to remember about you. Mm -hmm. And if you were to work with students, what assignments yeah. might we you know, come it's up like, with to make this What, what type of ancestor them? would you be? And that was the theme of mm -hmm. a conference, what is it? I think it, it was the American Association of State and Local History this past uh, September. What kind of ancestor will you be? Which means examining yourself now and assessing what is it that you're leaving? What are you doing to your community, your family, society? What's the record going to be? Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's such a painful question, right? Because let's turn it to our audience, I think, Dorothy, but I would say I operate with mm -hmm. real constraints on my agency, right? I mean, like I'm the, I'm the privileged subject as a white cisgender heterosexual male in society, but but I still feel constraints <laughs> yes. in, in yes. changing society. Um, what do you think, yeah, Dorothy? Do you want to turn it to like our colleagues and friends the in the audience? here that they're excited about the prospects of what this course will eventually shape up to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there are quite a okay. few comments. Questions, do you want to do you wanna yeah. run with some of the comments, perhaps? Oh, my Lord, they're, they're just, never mind, they're coming in. Mm -hmm. Um, no, actually, 
Uh, uh, oh my goodness, are you are you following the chat? It's um. It's quite a thing. Yes. Well, I see our friend Davis Hart uh, um, saying to answer our questions for Davis, this would be new and challenging constraints provoke extra mm -hmm. resiliency and surprising creativity. Agreed. Increase focus on health and mental well-being, mental and spiritual cultural levels through a design lens. I wonder, Davis, um, Dorothy, Eleni, and I have talked. We cannot. We could never even predict some of the archives of resiliency. These will be archives of struggle, right? But you might even find folks talking about connectivity and intimacy with their fellow human beings mm -hmm. in the moment where you least expect to yes. find it. Um, I wonder what Professor Mahesh meant by an archive for 2120, if Professor well, Mahesh could uh, He types fill us pretty in a quickly, bit. so we'll, we'll see, <laughs> see if he's got something in the works. He <laughs> also, I don't know if you saw his comment about, um, the, uh, the course reminds him of uh, Derrida's okay. archive fever, the constructivist notion of relationship between archiving, archives, authority, et cetera. Notes that you're you are having a great conversation and you've allowed us to be witness to it um, with questions uh, and, mm -hmm. and a meaningful proposition for current times and for posterity in equal measures. Mm. Well, well, Dorothy, maybe we take. Um, could you speak, Dorothy? You mentioned this brilliant thing to me yesterday about authority. That when you go to visit an archive, they often have oh, these yes. books, the finding the guides aids. that they want you to hmm. follow. Someone has written those. They are written in accordance with certain professional standards designed by whom, when, uh, whenever. That's kind of lost, but you know they are updated occasionally, yet they leave things out. So a finding aid is designed in a hierarchical fashion. What the archivist mm. thinks is important first. And that might not be what you, the researcher, the looker, thinks might be important first. So how, that, how those decisions are made have everything to do with uh, a notion of privilege, a sense of, well, this is important mm -hmm. and that isn't important, and that person is more important than the other. So there are all of these filters that mm -hmm. arranging an archive are put through. And archivists, there might be this, well, we, we're doing this objectively, but it, it isn't really objective. You're trying to be as accurate as you can, which is very much like journalists. There's no such thing as objectivity in journalism, even though that was drilled into my head years ago. You are objective. No, we're not. We can be accurate, but everything goes <laughs> through a filter. So. Well, you're, you're making me think about, so first of all, our, our colleague Kobe had put in the chat that there's a great deal of literature um, in their field concerning reading the silences and archives. And Kobe, this is synergistic, right? This is why we wanted to present in a discussion-based way because Dorothy and Eleni and I need to tap you about yes. that literature because we want our students reading about silences. But you're making, you're making me think, Dorothy, mm -hmm. about all of my work in, in archives in Germany. And archivists will often ask you, what story are you going to tell? Yes. Once they start giving you the sources, yeah. right? They will start asking, how mm -hmm. is the story? Mm -hmm. up? Because they have a stake yes. in it. And uh, a recent experience of mine, uh, kind of looking at one of the properties that Historic New England owns, which is this grand, glorious mansion that was built in 17-something by some rich guy and just passed it mm -hmm. all down, like five generations of people in this family. And then Historic New England acquires it. But the missing story is... Mm, there was slavery in this in this family. Uh, they made yeah, their money yeah. off slave trade. They had slaves working the land and working in the house, and the house is in Lincoln, Massachusetts. But historic New England Carm doesn't mention all the choices. <laughs> and if 
you go to the website and read about this place, it's kind of like a fairy tale story about how this beautiful property was created and it stayed in the family. And uh, so I'm looking in the archives because we have this family's papers going through the archives. And I do happen to know that there are such things as receipts, bills of sale for people. Yet those things aren't mentioned in the finding aids. So if you haven't heard word of mouth, from somebody that this stuff exists there, mm. you're not going to know to look for it. And there's a silence there. Part of that silence is uh, deliberate. It's intentional uh, because, you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable story. <laughs> no, no. And, and actually that segues to what Chala is saying to us in the chat, right? Because Chala and I, I know Chala and I are really interested in this, sort of individual phenomenologies, right? And Chala and I read queer theory, um, like Sarah Ahmed's queer phenomenology, and Chala is talking about the power of archives to challenge hegemonic yes. views. And I, I hope that's what we do. I hope we do messy history in this course with our mm -hmm. students, really messy, messy history, rather than coherent narrative. No, Although narrative will still be there. I, I, Vic, have we stepped um, on your moderator's toes? And time, and, and <laughs> we have 10 minutes. So I, I'm not sure whether we want to go to world history or whether we want to connect, um, we actually want to connect the discussion mm -hmm. about archiving, um, archives of the self mm -hmm. with the idea of cultural heritage, which is of course the, mm. the, the whole point of the grant that Eleni and Chala are working mm -hmm. on. And I know that Ale both Eleni and, and Eleni is right. involved in, in the archives of the self as well. But I, I Dorothy, I'm going to leave that to, up to you um, uh -huh. so, I mean, I shouldn't leave it up to you. That's a, that's an off, I'm sorry. That's too much pressure. That's really unfair. <laughs> I'm sorry I did that. But, Cause well, look, I was going to leave it up to well, Scott. <laughs> it's like, do you want to keep going Scott? Well, no, no, no. <laughs> Dorothy, it's Eliza. I, I can pull up your presentation. I think it flows nicely exactly into okay. archives of the self. Uh, you're looking at the self, uh, you know, in a historic mm -hmm. view of the self. So I think it, it's All fitting right. and it's 11 yeah, slides and be, we'll get to it. I, I shall be fast and I'm going to uh, hide myself here. Okay. I just finished oh, teaching my third semester at BAC World History and the beauty of teaching, one of the beauties of teaching at Boston Architectural College is that I got free reign. I mean, I had to deal with history and modernity. So that basically means uh, things start at a certain time uh, frame and then goes through kind of like where we are today. So I um, chose, so here we go. So my class starts with uh, the Industrial Revolution, late 1700s. The full name of the course is History and Modernity, the Idea of Empire. So I'm sure empire automatically triggers a certain image for you. Hmm. Okay, so that's the win of this course. The what is pretty much the, the uh, definition I was given when I came in to teach. So world history is, it's a, there's a whole lot of world history. It, it's, it's big, it's very big. So how do you teach that? What's important in teaching that? I decided though that instead of just talking about, oh, Western Europe did this and America did that, I wanted to use critical race theory and look at what was happening in other parts of the world that we aren't given. So that was my specific theme to use in uh, bringing out the world, showing students the world. And so critical race theory then would allow me to ask questions. Okay, so the French Revolution was happening. What was going on in Africa? The Industrial Revolution was happening and it did what to 
uh, Europe, Western Europe. But what was this, its effect in Asia? What was its effect in Africa? Uh, what was its effect in South America? We don't quite think in terms of those places when we think of the industrial revolution. So critical race theory, though, interesting framework to use. It originated in legal studies at Harvard, primarily with Professor Derek Bell. And it's got several tenets and hallmark themes. So you could probably like move to the next slide now. And the key tenets, oh, I, I love this, this um, quotation here by like what we call the Bible in uh, critical race theory. And that's um, a book which these two scholars kind of continually update. There's new editions all the time because more and more people are studying this area. So it started in legal studies, but it has an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, application. But I haven't found it so much in history, but I'm, I'm, I'm working with it. It's uh, highly prominent in education, in sociology, Key tenets, racism is normal. It's not an aberration. There's a lot of shock and awe reaction when we hear about a black person getting killed by police as though, oh my God, that, that's like an isolated event and it only happened one time, but it's a regular occurrence. Systemic racism, uh, the way the institutions in our society operate, that's all normal. Race is a social construct. It does not exist at all. It was something humans created in order to place one another in hierarchical positions. Interest convergence. Uh, there's really never any progress toward eradicating racism, at least in the, in the United States, until there is something in it for white people. And you can ask me about that later. And intersectionality, that's where we all have uh, so many varied aspects of our identity. We're not just one thing or one facet. So one of the examples I give my students is if I wanted to sue an employer on the basis of discrimination, I would not be able to do so. Uh, on both the basis of being female and being black. The law is such that I would have to pick one or the other. I can't do both, huh? Uh, because both of those can come into play. Ultimate goal of critical race theory, to eradicate all forms of discrimination and oppression. So other groups have adopted these tenets. And so now we'll have, we have, um, queer crit, there's a uh, Latino crit, a whole host of other groups that typically have been marginalized in society are now looking at how these groups are treated in society as well as their history through this lens. Okay, next. <laughs> okay, now human geography. This is where I just went like wild. Oh my God, this is intense. Uh, that human geography came into my life a few years ago, but I never quite put it anywhere. And just a couple of months ago, I discovered that human geography takes into account critical race theory a whole lot. So I said, wouldn't it be cool to design my course so that I am looking at human geography, critical race theory, and applying that to world history. Whoa, so you've got human geography here that you know it's looking at things spatially. And when I think of world history, I do think that why did why do things happen where they happen? Uh, what happened with the uh, scramble for Africa, the partitioning of Africa, the, the way the West 
came in, particularly Britain, and just took over all these other places on the planet. What does the geography tell us about the activities in our history? So human geography seeks to understand why the spatial nature of social things matter. And world history is a social thing. Okay, let's see next. Um, also, there's an unevenness of human existence on this planet, in space, between different places. And I see racism and discrimination as being manifest, manis, manifestations of that unevenness. So next, all right, this is really, really cool. Um, everything that happens in human life occurs in a certain space and everything that happens takes place. Now, think about that having a double meaning, takes place as in occurs and takes place meaning Occupy, occupies space. So I think that putting human geography or using human geography to look at world history will help students understand what this whole history thing is about, that it isn't simply a collection of facts that they need to memorize, uh, that it does play a role in why we are where we are today, why we do what we do, respond what we, the, the ways in which we do. And we're looking at a big picture with occasions to move down into smaller spaces to see the relationship between events and occurrences. Next. All right. I think a lot of this started for me here. When I saw this map, it blew my mind. For one thing, it, it was a totally different perspective on how we're accustomed to seeing Africa. So this map was done by a, a Swedish artist who just decided he was going to do a whole lot of research and recreate Africa in a different way. So what he did was used linguistic research to find out what the language languages were and where using that as boundaries uh, for where groups of people existed in Africa. And he gave the map the orientation uh, that would have been used in Islamic carto cartography. So that's why we're looking at it upside down. But I also like the, uh, the upside down view because uh, looking from Europe to Africa kind of gives us the sense that Europe is looking down on Africa. This way, we're, we've definitely a different picture. So this particular artist continued this map by keeping those boundaries and then superimposing on them the boundaries that the Western European nations created in Africa when they carved it all up. And it's really interesting to see. So these are like really fluid lines of where people existed, uh, the languages that they spoke, but a modern day map of Africa will has very straight lines, like, the, like a, a cookie cutter or a box cutter was used to create them. And as this artist puts it, um, these were, the borders of present day Africa countries are like rule, they were rulers drew them using rulers. So they really don't make any sense according to who existed on Africa or what the terrain was like. It was just, I want this much, I want that much, and that all came from Europe.
So next. So, ha, huh, history makes geography. Cool, cool statement. Um, that's Africa on the left or 1890 as it was carved up. And that's another view of the uh, Swedish artist map. And his view is, is that Africa would have looked different if history played out a bit differently. So I am interested in presenting these ideas to students just to have them think differently about the world that they know, to learn something about the world that they don't know, and somehow make geography really, really interesting, or history, geography, really interesting to students who are studying architecture. And I think there might be one more slide. Ah, yes. History is a work in progress. I like to think of history as a work in progress and not something that has happened, is done, is over. It's still happening and also our interpretations of it and our reinterpretations of it change, which is as it should be. So is there anything else behind that one, that last slide there? <laughs> mm -hmm. And if you want, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop okay. sharing, and you can take the camera and mic and keep talking. If you have a few more, we can stay. We can go okay, past cool. two thirty. Um, wow. Well, you know, I could like <laughs> about this stuff all day. Um, that's what happens when you're kind of a history geek, yeah. <laughs> Oh, his, someone said reclaimed from James Joyce. I'm not sure I know what that means. Ooh, mm-hmm. Hmm. Titled a work. Uh, we're waiting to see what he famously titled a work. That was not complete. <laughs> <laughs> so it title was like, M. I don't know. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Well, Karen, uh, camera and Mike, if you want to jump in. Yeah. Or any more questions for Scott? Oh, Finnegan's Wake. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a movie though. <laughs> yeah. And if there's a, like any other questions for like what Scott and I are doing, and I, I, I'm sure whatever what this is that I'm putting together for the class that I'll be starting next semester will surely inform what the class in archives of the self will also be about. So I'm I'm very certain that they'll play off one another. And well, one thing I'd like to say about the successes that I had this semester as I was edging toward this view was one thing I tore up my uh, syllabus. Don knows about this. If Don is still here, he, he knows about why I tore up my syllabus, which meant that I had to do something else, uh, had to come up with something else. And another thing I did was I spoke with the students and tried to find out more about what they wanted uh, because they were in a required course. So what do, what can you do? What do you want? And a lot of them did not want to do a final research paper. They said, okay, we'll change this to a final project. What skills do you want to use to do something that uses critical race theory to look at uh, an event in history or some period in history. And being design students, a lot of them can draw, they do visual work. So a number of them did do visual work, which was awesome. I'm so glad that I did that. Um, it just really brought them out of their shells and just made me go, oh, I, I, they got it, they got it, so. <laughs> Yeah. 
I'm challenging the linear progress narrative. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is the world around us designed to always get better? No. No. <laughs> um, we want it to. I think that's you know, a, a myth we have latched onto. And we think that every we think that things were better in the past mm. we think that there was peace all over the world at one point and we want to restore world peace never was and i that makes me think of the year 1848 very significant year because every country in europe was having a revolution what the heck was going on and then if you look at all of this you'll find that this, it was the same reasons all the time, the same reasons today that a lot of revolutions and revolt are going on. It's economics. It's lack of jobs. It's lack of housing. It's this. So when are we going to get it? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see. Just going to come. Time check. Uh, I know. Uh, Vic had to, to leave exactly at 2.30, yeah. but I'm wow. glad that we were able to keep going. And uh, your piece at the end, Dorothy, really did tie it all together. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, here as we wind down our 1.30 discussion series of our uh, founding week, uh, celebrating the BAC, our, our, our past, mm -hmm. present, and our future. And the future that you've envisioned is uh, more, seemed a, a more informed audience uh, for what's next for what this generation leaves behind. And so, so much of that agenda was also set forth by some of our students yesterday. So I'm excited to watch your class unfold. Congratulations to the hard work. Uh, you're getting a lot of well done, Dorothy, and uh, well done, Dorothy, well done, Scott, well done, Eleni, well done, Chala, well done, audience, for sticking all together. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think we are now at that time where we've gone 10 minutes over, but, uh, you know, thank you all, Heather, if you want to say anything, closing remarks on uh, founding week before we launch into founding day tomorrow uh, is great. And, um, you know, all our video recordings will be available on our website later. So, you know, we can, we can share the work that our faculty uh, have been doing through this pandemic. So Scott, there you go. There's something for the archives and Kobe. Um, so, all right, if any of our panelists, guests, colleagues have anything more to close us out, I am gonna end the session, but thank you and uh, happy founding week. Don't forget, see you tomorrow uh, for a special toast. Bye-bye. <laughs>